Well, this is the fourth week we've talked about money in the money series. I hear people laugh when we run that little bumper, which means you haven't been here in the last four weeks. God bless you. We're glad you made it this morning and glad you enjoyed, <laughs> glad you enjoyed the bumper. I heard people laughing and I thought, where have you been, man? This is four weeks by now. You know. You've been in Florida. Well, we give you a pass. God bless you. God bless you. Florida needed you, Jeannie. It needed you. That the word of the Lord may run. A bizarre turn of the phrase, only the American Standard Version grabs it. And when you look at the Greek language, it, it really grabs it essentially as it, as it is implied and as the language expresses it. And I realize with, with more and more of the modern translations, they're trying to put it in a language that's, that holds true to the intent but speaks clearer to a generation. But you just can't, you can't beat this one line from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that the word of the Lord may run. Keep that in mind. I opened this series of messages looking at the rich young ruler having everything and yet lacking a giving heart. Then we moved on to stewardship in this life as God has placed all things in our hands and how through the stewardship of those things we store up riches in heaven as, as difficult as that is to get our arms around and as hard as it is for us to fathom what riches in heaven might look like, the scripture teaches us consistency, consistently so we need to grapple with that. And then last week tried to lay down just a basic and brief history of giving, of biblical giving, that took us beyond the tithe, that took us back to the very beginning, all the way to the, to the gates of the garden in the story of Cain and Abel. And finally, I turn our attention this morning in giving to missions. To missions. When I talk about missions giving, I'm talking about giving beyond the four walls of this church. I'm, I'm talking about Giving that goes beyond keeping this lighthouse in working order and caring for people who come through our doors. Missions giving is a kind of giving in a local church that does not benefit in a material way the efforts of that local church in their community. But I will forever argue in Calvary's history that the wonderful blessings that have fallen upon us flow in large part from the consistent and generous financial participation in the whiten to harvest missions fields of the world. I do not believe that a church's missions giving is something magical. I don't believe it's kind of we give four and God will give eight. And I, I don't believe in the formulaic approach. But I will tell you this. I have seen throughout my ministerial life, having witnessed an awful lot of churches in a lot of circumstances and situations, God blesses missions giving churches. He simply does. He simply does. And it's who we are. We are, as part of the Assemblies of God, we are a missionary movement. We were formed out of the Azusa Street Revival, the aftermath of the Azusa Street Revival, the Pentecostal Revival that shook the world in 1905, from which, by the way, almost all of the Pentecostal denominations and then, as an outgrowth, charismatic movements around the world, almost all of them flow out of that one earth-shaking event that only lasted three and a half years. We were born out of that revival. That Pentecostal revival revolved around the rediscovery or the re-emphasis on the spiritual gifts in the Bible in Corinthians and also the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised and that is evident in the book of Acts, being re-embraced by the church, saying we believe that God will empower us to do the supernatural. We believe that God will empower us with spiritual gifts to be effective in this world and in this life. We believe that the power of the Spirit is given on purpose. From the very, beginner, from the very beginning, the founders of our movement within the Assemblies of God had this clear biblical point of order that they kept always at the forefront of our agendas. They said the power of the Spirit has purpose and the purpose of the power is for missions. It's for the winning of the lost and the preaching of the gospel. 
From the promise Luke records in Acts chapter 1-8, these words that fall from Jesus' lips. He said, wait in Jerusalem till you've received the power of the Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That missionary call, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, that missionary call is made possible, it is equipped, it is outfitted, it is enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit poured out in Acts 2 and 4 and on us. If the church is true to her God-given identity, the church is, at her very core, a missionary endeavor. A church that is not missionary has to ask herself, what in the world are we here for? Would you agree with me that our cause to be in the world is to advance, is to advance the message of the gospel that all men might come to Christ? This is our calling. This is who we are. We are missionary. We can't get away from it, even though we often try, it seems. The Spirit was poured out that the work that Jesus prescribed could be accomplished. Jesus' last command must become our great concern, and his last command was this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations. Go. This is the mandate of Calvary Church. This is our history also. At my second board meeting here in Greensboro at the tender age of 26, in a meeting with my three deacons, in a church that numbered 40 souls, we reviewed our finances. It didn't take long. We reviewed the membership. That didn't take long. We looked at the improvements that needed to be made. That was a lengthy discussion. Improvements in our parking lot, which wasn't paved. Our building that had no sign on it. Floors, tile floors that were cracked. People would walk through the door of that church, and I've got to tell you, friends, I say this in kindness, everything about the place said, stay away, stay away, you don't want to come here. We looked at all of those things in my early uh, tenure as a pastor, saying, what can we fix, what can we change, what's going to take time, What step do we take next? We were tiny. We were impoverished. In that second second meeting held at one of the deacon's houses, I then turned us to the list of missionaries supported by the tiny church at $20 a month. Now you have to understand our budget. That first year, our budget was about somewhere between $33,000 and $38,000 for the entire year. They paid the preacher and they took care of all the bills out of that. That was the church budget. And they had four, I believe it was four Assemblies of God missionaries supporting them at at $20 a month. That's 80 bucks a month, a $38,000 budget. That's a nice little piece of of the pie that we could have spent right here in Greensboro. But the church had a missions history. And while the list of missionaries was very short, in talking with those deacons, They were pleased with the fact, as they should have been, they were pleased with the fact that the church had never in her history failed to pay their missions pledges all the way back to 1951, when the church had been much smaller and at times when it was only a handful of families. The commitments they had made to world missions, they had held good on. They had always paid those missions pledges. I shared with the deacons that night how I was raised in a missions culture, in a missions church, and I could not foresee, and I'd already shared this at the interview, I could not foresee pastoring a church that did not have a missionary heart, that would not send people to the field, that would not enable people to go to the far ends of the earth, that would not give the monies that were necessary to produce the the materials, that, that would not help support the effort all over the world. I said, I just cannot imagine being part of a church that doesn't have this at the very core of its being. And so that night, I asked them to take a step of faith with me, and we doubled our missionary footprint. We said, we have four missionaries. We're going to pick up four more. That will give us eight missionaries. We've never turned back from that day. But aside from the 
aside from career missionaries that we support, we began to recognize as doors opened around the world the potential for sending teams in for short-term efforts, whether it be medical missions or whether it be building a building or whether it be scripture distribution or street witnessing or, or pastoral training. We realized that we could send teams in in a short little burst and we could really help the missionaries there aside from the fact that we take funding in to help them also. And so we started doing that, and then we began to tie our, our we began to, to uh, connect with missional partners, missional partners like Book of Hope, back then known as Book of Life. Now it's known under the umbrella of, of One Hope. We were fully engaged with One Hope and sending teams with One Hope and trying to answer the call of One Hope to put the scriptures, the Bible, in the hands of every child in the world. God's word, every child, that's their calling. We began to tie into that type of thing. And so our missionary footprint has just continued to grow through the years. This morning, well above the $20, I, I think the basic, the starting level for our missionaries is $100 a month for a missionary family. But we support now more than 40 missionaries and their families receiving that support. Eight, in addition to that, are U.S.-based missions uh, that are engaged here in the United States and between the U.S. and some foreign field. We're also involved with our teams traveling, five and six teams a year, offering support to world missionaries, helping launch initiatives, building where they cannot. In the past calendar year, the past calendar year alone here at Calvary, $522,000 came through us and out through us to the world. It's the first time in our history we have seen a half a million dollars pass through our hands. And while I say that, I say it with great joy and I say it with not a bit of boasting. If I boast in anything, I will boast in the Lord who has prospered us and granted us a generous heart. If we boast at all in this, we must boast in, in the fact that God has placed us where he has placed us. He has used us as he has used us. We need to say all glory be to God. May he be praised and may he pour out even greater blessing that we might be a greater blessing blessing in the world. This is who we are. This is what we are about. We cannot exist without our mission's heart. I will not pastor a church that doesn't have a mission's heart. Because to not have a mission's heart is to abandon the gospel. It's God's word for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. We must never forget it. And that requires funding. Which is why above tithe and offering here at Calvary, we encourage everybody who walks through our door to become a missions giver where every week or every month there is something that they put aside. It's above and beyond everything else they give, but it's something that they put aside to say, this is a missionary offering. This goes, and anything that is ever given here at Calvary Church to missions, not a penny of it goes to administration of anything that happens within our sphere. Every penny of it goes to the intended purpose, to a mission field in the world. This is who we are. And I'm bold enough to say this is who every church should be. Because there are presently 3.2 billion people on the planet who have not heard an adequate witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 3.2 billion people who are going to hell without Jesus. That should trouble us. Paul, on his second missionary journey, heard what we have come to know as the Macedonian call. He had walked the entire length of the nation of Turkey through horrible mountain passes, through snow, and difficulty, and pain, and suffering. Forbidden, one of the strangest portions of Scripture we find in the book of Acts, forbidden by the Spirit to preach in the places along the way. He was marching blindly, just going on, taking the next step, not knowing exactly where it was that the Lord was leading him. If you remember the story, he marches completely across modern-day Turkey, and he comes to a place called Troas on the edge of the Aegean Sea. And it's while he is in Troas that he hears what we know as the Macedonian call. In a vision, a Greek man or a Macedonian man appears to him and says, come to Macedonia and help us. And for the first time in months, Paul had a clear idea as to where it is that God wanted him to go. He quickly crossed the Aegean with Silas and also with a man that he had just met, Luke. And he arrived in 
Philippi. And from Philippi, he launched the Greek chapter of the expansion of the church. From Philippi, he went on to Thessalonica, eventually all the way down to Corinth. And from Corinth, he was there for an extended period of time. He began to write back letters, and we have the letter to the Thessalonians written in Corinth. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he writes these words in the middle of his second missionary journey endeavor. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run and be glorified, even as also it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and evil men, for all have not faith. As a Pharisee steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, Paul reached back. This would have been filed away in his theological memory banks from his boyhood. He simply reached back to Psalm 147, 15, where David wrote these words. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. Paul grabbed the language of David and said to the Thessalonians, and this we pray, that the word of the Lord will run swiftly. It has been my distinct and rare pleasure to have a front row seat and a very physical engagement in the running of the gospel in the nation of Zambia. Through Hope Ride, through my hobby, riding a bicycle, through a means that I never would have imagined, through a a, a dream that really didn't come to fruition until we just started raising a few bucks for for missions with bicycles, through through a, a process that only God could have dreamed up. I was given a front row seat in the breaking in of the kingdom of God in a place where the gospel had not taken root five years ago. Five years ago, there was absolutely nothing going on for the gospel in the western region of Zambia and especially in the lower region of the Zambezi near the town of Sioma. Western Zambia is forgotten by the political powers that rule from the eastern part of the state. You have to understand that nobody's wanted West Zambia from the beginning. Western Zambia is former Baratse land. It is tribal land. Eastern Zambia is much more modernized. Eastern Zambia is is much more metropolitan. You have, at least in Eastern Zambia, you have some big cities like Lusaka and Livingston. You've got some gathering places and some educational centers. But West Zambia is all tribal land. And West Zambia, East Zambia has always been somewhat of a difficult design And when through the wars and through the different partitioning, Zambia became its own nation, East Zambia really didn't want West. And so the government powers that be empowered the king of the Baratse people, the king of Baratse land in the West, they empowered him to retain his tribal control over that region, but they don't give him any money. Eastern Zambia is rich opposed to Western Zambia. I can take you to the city of Livingston. We'll get in a vehicle. I won't tell you where it is. We will begin to drive to the West. And as we drive to the West, you will know the moment we have passed from East Zambia into West Zambia. You'll know it by the roads. Because everything in Western Zambia is literally falling apart, deteriorating, and there's no funds. There's no money. West Zambia is a forgotten It's a forgotten place, left to her tribalism, left to the rule of the Baratse king, abandoned to poverty and mud and thatch huts, subsistence farming, only the most basic of education. West Zambia has languished, and the Lazi people were still, they are still classed in Zambia, not in other places in the world, but in Zambia, they are still classed as an unreached people group. But God opened a door for reaching a generation. Our missional partner there, Jacques van Bommel. And what God has done. You, many of you know the story. For those of you who don't know the Hope Ride story, let me just give you kind of a nutshell. Five years ago, I was invited by my friend Jacques van Bommel. He said, would you come over? I'm going to Zambia. We're thinking about putting a base up there and doing some ministry. But as a missions giving pastor, would you come and would you look at it with me? I feel like you're supposed to be there. 
because I believe that Jacques is this apostolic figure that God has raised up. I said, sure, I'll come. So I went and I met Jacques and I traveled with him and we went out to villages and we were, in, we were more in the eastern part of, of Zambia, but went out to, to the villages outside of the cities completely where people were living as they had lived 400, 500 years ago. We didn't have to go far, by the way. It was 20 minutes into the bush, only 20 minutes. And you are completely in another world. I found myself absolutely gobsmacked. I was, I was in awe. Beyond, it was beyond my comprehension that people could live this way. And story after story after story after story cemented in my own heart the hopelessness and the darkness and the demonic nature of the oppression of these people. Denied the light of the gospel. The darkness, you could almost feel it, you could touch it. And many of the people don't read and most of them can't go through, many of them don't get to go to school past the third or the fourth grade. And, and I was thinking of all of the vehicles we've used before to reach people and every one of them seemed to bounce right back at me like, no, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. And in utter frustration, one day I turned to Jacques. It was a day that changed my life. As a matter of fact, it may be, it may be the day that God shifted some things in my life to open up the most effective work of my life. In that moment, I was standing there with him, and I said, Jacques, you have to understand, this is the spirit it was offered into. It's like, Jacques, what am I doing here? I said, I am a, I'm an American pastor. I do not speak this language. I'm not very good cross-culturally. I am lousy, absolutely lousy with children. I have nothing. I have absolutely nothing to bring to this. I, I don't, I'm not a missions strategist. I, I, I don't know where you would even begin. You're talking about starting with the Jesus film and people, and I don't see power anywhere. And I, All I see is obstacles. Jacques, what in the world am I doing here? And he just looked at me and said, well, Pastor, you don't see anybody else here, do you? And it's still... It still breaks my heart. It still changes me. You don't see anybody else here, do you? It was out of that encounter that I said, okay, we're going to bring a bicycle team. We're going to raise money for what? And Jock said, we've got a little well drilling outfit, and we're going to start drilling wells in the villages and see if they'll let us start Sunday schools. I said, that's a start. That's all I need to know. I'm going to bring some people. We're going to raise some money. We're going to ride a few hundred miles, and we're going to take that money, and we're going to put it into well drilling. Well, that's, that's where it all started about $680,000 ago. Hallelujah. That's where it started. That's where it started. God opens these doors. And just so you'll understand, I have, I have literally sat on the front row and I have watched the gospel run. <laughs> I have watched it literally run ahead of us. I've watched opportunities open down the line that we never even would have imagined. I have watched the gospel outstrip all of our efforts as one heart is touched, and then another heart is touched, and then another testimony is given, and then another one is won. And before long, you've got a movement. Let me give you a scope right now of what was nothing five years ago. Two ministry bases, two of them on the Zambezi, housing teams for ongoing training and also housing our work, worker base. 7,000 children now in our weekly children's churches. We started by sending a pontoon down the Zambezi and starting on, this, on the sandbanks of the Zambezi, but now we are launching children's churches everywhere as we're training the workers to send them out. 7,000 children in our weekly children's churches hearing the word of God. 42 children's church sites. Some of our sites we to use for two villages. 42 sites that are being manned right now by a volunteer worker corps that's been raised up. 4,000 children being fed five days a week in our school feedings programs. But this is, only be, this is only the beginning. We feed them only for a season. We feed them long enough so they'll allow our sustainable farming expert to come in and show them how to plant moringa trees, show them how to plant and care for also crops in, in a way that 
Uh, the drought doesn't get them. And since we put down a well almost always right beside the school, there's water to water the crops. And even in the drought, they can get the crops and the children are eating out of the gardens. And so we feed about 4,000 at a time for a two-year cycle, but then they're not fed by us anymore because they're growing food for themselves right there at the school. It's not being abused in the village and carried off for someone else. And this is happening right now. We're in 10 schools right now, five meals per week with the agricultural component. 105 wells are pumping water right now. 105 wells. Four churches, four churches are now planted and established. There was a, a girl that I met two years ago. Her name is Karen. I met her at the base. She had come in for, for her second training with our, with our workers, and she was growing by such leaps and bounds in the Lord. You just knew that she was going to do something. Karen is two years old in the Lord, and Karen is pastoring one of our churches right now. She's trained, and she's trained, and she's trained. And she's, you're saying, what are you doing taking people that are just novices like that and sending them out in the harvest field? We're sending them out with a message that sets people free, and they preach the message, and people are saved, and lives are changed. So I pray for more Karens. Our very first Imagine Hope Center. Imagine Hope Center is a, uh, it's a, a bizarre <laughs> idea. It was a whim. It was, an, it was a wild one that just kind of flew across the radar and somebody grabbed it and some Amish people got involved with it. About four months ago, we shipped over two containers and in those containers were all of the building materials needed to set one container at one end of a pad, the other container at the other end of the pad, empty the container out, build the trusses over the top of the containers, linking them together, close it in on both sides. The containers were already set up with bathrooms pre-plumbed inside of them, and then inside the area there's living space for this Imagine Hope Center where 16 of the throwaway girls in that culture, if you're not married by the time you're 12 or 13, if nobody wants you or nobody wants to make a deal on you, you're going to end up basically um, a burden to people or you're going to end up starving or you're going to end up in prostitution or you're going to end up in, in, you're going to end up in a bad, bad way. And by the thousands, these girls are thrown away because they're not, adopt, they're, they're not taken on as a fifth wife or a sixth wife in, in the tribal situation. And so for these girls, and there are so many of them, we've started this ministry, this idea that we can bring them in, we can introduce them to Jesus, of course, we can minister to them, we can help them, but we can also teach them a couple of sustaining, uh, a couple of sustaining job skills whereby they've then got something to offer so they are not left alone. Our first 16 girls, all of them, by the way, not, not all of them knew Jesus when they came, but all of them now have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Our first 16 girls are moving in. They're moving into the house next week. Hallelujah. And we can do this, we can do this anywhere. We can do this everywhere in West Zambia. And you say, well, that's a crazy idea. Yeah, it's just, it, it's amazing what happens when the gospel runs. Community centers, the smaller community centers are in the works that will serve as a base for our children's churches, but also then the establishment of a local church, a full-fledged church in those communities. All of this, all of this in five years, not because of us. We took the first step and the gospel has run in Zambia. I believe that if we preach the gospel, if we take the gospel, if we live the gospel, the gospel will do the work. The gospel will change people's lives. When I read Paul asking the Thessalonian church to pray that the word of God will run, I know what he's talking about. I know what he's dreaming about, for I've witnessed, I've witnessed it as Paul did, the gospel spreading throughout Macedonia. But there are, that time cannot be right. Okay, quickly, there are three things that we must not lose sight of in, in our missionary endeavors, okay? Hang with me. We're going to get there. First of all, it's the message, not the messenger, that changes hearts. Paul's request gives clear evidence he was under no misgivings as to the transformational power of the gospel. He does not say, pray that we will run swiftly. He recognizes the word of God has the capacity to outrun us. It's faster than we are. It's stronger than we are. It'll go places we can't even go. Certainly the messenger has his part, Paul said famously to the Romans in chapter 10. 
How then will they call on him whom they've not believed? How will they believe in him whom they've not heard? How will they hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. It all comes back to the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet don't change hearts. It's the good news. It's the good news that changes heart. And the messenger cannot keep up with the message where this gospel is preached. God's word spreads exponentially. Last week, Sherry and I attended for two days the annual meeting for One Hope, who will distribute 113 million copies of that simplified children's gospel around the world in this year. 113 million. Now stop and think about this. I was on the team in 2000, 2001, somewhere in there, in Siberia, where we gave out the 100 millionth copy of the Book of Hope. Man, we were excited. We, were, we could not imagine what God had done over those, well, it had been about 10 years, nine years. 100 million copies. Now, every year, we've passed 100 million copies. We're past 1.3 billion copies distributed around the world. Simplified scriptures, why do we do that? We believe that the word of God will run. We believe the word of God will run. Sherry and I heard testimony after testimony uh, last week, shook our hearts. The power of the gospel. One after another, they would get up and they would tell us stories about someone who had received the book who did not have a pastor, did not have a disciple, or did not have someone with the four spiritual laws there to help them, didn't have anyone to take them down the Roman road, but they read the scriptures, and in reading the scriptures, they acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God, and they began to pray to him, and eventually people came alongside and helped them. But testimony after testimony after testimony of the Word of God touching the lives of people and changing them forever. One young lady brought over from China to report to us. She now directs Book of Hope for all of China and at great, at great risk. She told her story of getting a copy of the Book of Hope and in reading the story of Jesus, she believed and became a follower. Now she is a major factor in changing the face of China from the inside out. The Word of God is running in China. The stories continued from Africa and Brazil and even Tibet. God uses messengers to carry the life-giving message, but there is no change no matter how many wells we sink, how many clothes we supply or meals that we offer, except for his supernatural, except for this supernatural message. There's no change. Second, it's the message, it's not the method that changes lives. In Zambia, we drill water wells. We connect those wells with the message of the gospel unapologetically. It's a method, and it's driven by a, humanitarian, by a humanitarian effort also, and that's all good with us because every, every truly humanitarian effort will be driven by the love of God. We're compelled by love. That lies at the corner. It's at the corner of our methodologies, but it's not the methods. It's the message. In Zambia with the children's churches, we abandoned failed methods that went on before. Before the missionaries would go in and they would try and build a, an adult church, get enough adult adherence, and then later on, as they got large enough and strong enough, they would develop something for the children. Where they never got large enough, they never got strong enough, they never reached out for the children and they died on the vine. Everything we do, everything we, we try through job training, agricultural projects, school feeding, wells, gardens, medical clinics, going to the children, every method is simply a means of delivering the message. And when some of our methods fail, then we abandon them and we find another method. But the method always gives itself to presenting the message. What I appreciate about reaching a generation in one hope is these, these folks, these missional partners with us, have freed themselves from the bondage of what has worked in the past or what has worked someplace else. They, have, they are completely free of institutional models and methods that somehow lose their effectiveness over time, and they're willing just to go in and use any method, any method that presents itself that will adequately get the gospel to people. Let me contemporize this. How many of you are raised in a Sunday school and you had flannel graph lessons? Just a few. No millennials, I'll tell you that. Remember flannel graphs? It was a piece of cardboard that had flannel down over the front of it, and then all of the characters that were being taught in the Bible stories were little punch-out characters, paper characters, and the back was made abrasive so the teacher could take that, that figure and 
and it would hold on the flannel graph and they would walk Paul along the road. To, do you remember that? You remember that? Those of you who are raised on flannel graph, you know exactly what it is I, I, I'm talking about. But let me ask you this. In the day of iPhones and iPads and video and HD, would, would we be nuts if we retained or if we were tied to flannel graphs? Would you think that we had absolutely lost our minds of saying that within our children's churches, within our Sunday schools, we use only flannel graph? Why? Because they've used flannel graph for years. And it worked. How many of you would think that we maybe had lost our minds? If you don't think we, we, we just, just go with me on this. I'm not going to try and get you to, to respond. No, you adapt to advance the cause of Christ. The method is not the thing. It's the message. Finally, it's a message opposed that sets men and women free. The gospel's resisted every place you take it. You have to grapple with that. It's not going to be easy. The mission uh, is fraught with difficulty. In Zambia, a missionary named Daniel went over and he tried. He tried for eight years. He labored and he tried and he was faithful and he built a house and, a, and made it so that it could be a base for missionary teams coming in and he expanded it and he, he, he worked himself, he worked himself to the bone. But he saw absolutely no fruit and after eight years, as Jacques had just come into the region and they had just started building the base, he came to him and he said, would you please just buy this property out and do something with it because I'm done. The mission field is tough. It's hard. We have two bases because of Daniel. And I never want to forget that. Every time I set foot on the second base on the Zambezi, I want to remember somebody came here and they had a dream and they had a vision, but it was tied to one way of doing things. And missionary work is tough and it failed. I never want to forget that, that it's sometimes hard, that some seasons are dry, that sometimes we'll encounter difficulties, that sometimes we'll be attacked from the outside, that sometimes we'll be dealing with the demonic, that sometimes we're going to know incredible opposition. I never want to, be, I never want to remove myself from that. Paul was clear in writing to the Corinthians when he described his beatings and sufferings, his scars, his shipwrecks, his constant dangers. Paul recognized that this is the price. This is part of the gospel invading the dark world. There's going to be warfare. And it's more than giving. It's praying. Paul saw the dangers. And he recognized that the doors of opportunity always looked dangerous. He said, there's a wide door open to me, 1 Corinthians 16, 9. There's a wide door of effective work open to me, but there are many adversaries. Someone said it this way, demons camp out at open doors. Wherever a door opens for the gospel, you can be sure that demonic activity will be stirred up to pluck the seed away before it can take root. And you see, that's what the enemy's after. He wants to, wherever we go, he wants to immediately frustrate that work. He wants us to back off. He wants us to say, didn't work. He wants us to give up. Because he knows the power of the seed. Rob Hoskins said this week, so simple, so true. He said, it's not the distribution of God's word that changes lives. This said by a man who's distributing 113 million copies of the word of God this year. He said, it is not the distribution of the word that changes life. It is the entrance of God's word that changes the life. We've got to get it there. And then it must make entrance in the heart. And so I know this morning if we can get God's worth into North Korea, into Mud Hut, Zambia, into China, Indonesia, if we can get God's word deep into Brazil, if we can get it in through the missionaries we send, through the methods we employ, through the Godman film, through 17 stories, through Book of Hope, through Hope Ride, if we can get the message out and it finds its place in one heart, the gospel can run. It can run. That's why we give, that's why we pray, that's why we go, that's why we're helping to establish the church in Cuba, that's why we're building up the work in Guatemala through Carolyn's Promise, that's why we're trekking into the Amazon with Dr. Bob Harmon, that's why we're expanding leadership academies in South Africa through Pastor Tom's ministry there, that's why we're raising money for Hope Ride, or through Hope Ride, for Zambia, that's why we continue to expand our missionary family, working with new missional partners, doing all that we can that God's word may run, and that the message of Jesus Jesus might be spread about the world. 
And this is, this is what I ask you this morning. I ask you to take part in the world harvest God has called us to. I am not looking for whales this morning. I'm not looking for that $30,000 donor, that $50,000 donor, and I'm not going to come out among you and say, who will give five, who will give 10? Come on, you can match it. I'm not gonna play games with you. I'm gonna ask you to do one thing, and that is to ask yourself, what am I doing for the great commission in the world right now in my life? And if you end up with crickets, if you end up with dead air, I want to invite you to an opportunity to become a missions giver on a regular basis, whether it's weekly or it's monthly. And I'm going to challenge you with it for six months. For six months. I'm not going to put a dollar amount on it. For some of you, it might be five bucks a month. Well, over six months, that's $30. You say, I can afford $30. If you'll sign a card this morning and say, I'm going to become a regular missions giver, watch what God does. Watch what God does. If your heart is moved like mine and you want to give like you've never given before, then take that step. It is a faith pledge. Some of you say, well, I haven't got any more. I haven't got any more to give. I'm living on fumes right now. A faith promise is a faith promise. You come before God and you say, I believe that as I will, as a steward, release funds to meet the needs of the world with the gospel, I believe that you will bless me and supply what I need. So Lord, I make you first, and maybe your missions pledge is $100 a month. You say, okay, Lord, this is my faith pledge. I believe as I pay my faith pledge, you're going to provide for my need. This is where generally I could trundle out at least a half a dozen testimonies of people who could tell their stories, but we have no time. I've used it all. But are the cards in your bulletin? Do you have one of those cards this morning? And ushers, do we have those available? If you did not receive a card, just lift a hand and we'll get to you. There's some right up here on, on my right. If you'd just be watching for those ushers. And on the far, far right too. But honestly, I don't care about the amount. I care about our participation in the harvest. You can walk out these doors today and say, okay, I'm signed up. I am now a Great Commission Christian. I'm a Great Commission giver. Over here. I'm a Great Commission giver. And so I want you just to take a moment and pray. And the card simply says, as God enables me, over the next six months, I am making a faith promise that will help take the message of Jesus into the world by giving. And there's a place for a monthly amount there. Nobody is going to call you. Nobody's going to chase you down. Nobody's going to check and make sure. It's between you and God. The reason that we want those pledges is because we'll take a step of faith too. We'll look at those pledges and say, okay, we're believing God for this and more, and so we're going to take on more missionaries and we're going to fund more, pro we're going to go out on the limb. We're going to take that step. What a great place to live, by the way. Have you been out on the limb lately? That's where the fruit is. Those of you who have been hugging the tree stump, you got to climb the tree and get out on the limb. That's where the fruit is. So when you have filled out that card, Sherry's going to continue to play some of the old missions theme songs. And when you have answered to become a monthly mission giver, just fill out that amount with your information and just leave it face down with the faith side up, just face down on this communion table. Just say your prayer. Say, Lord, okay, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you as I give. You will provide. I want to be engaged in the Great Commission. That's my heart self. And may God richly bless you with joy upon joy upon joy as you begin to walk out this life of faith in giving. Father, use us in the grace of giving for your glory and your honor. Advance the cause of your kingdom in the world through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you.